right back, Charlie. Oh, 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 Me and the different knock, aka Alex. It's always a good one to be here with you. We say, my guy, I think we're going to give Saka another card around for their money. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. Can you hear me? My, is my mic working? Yeah, I saw you playing with your mic. Yeah, you can okay, hear you. Good, good stuff. Because I've, I've just <laughs> taken over I'm good, man. How are you? Sorry, I'm late. I'm Apologies. Good. I woke up. Nice. Nah, right. Actually, you see, he said he's late. I always get, I always get the blame for once. I saw cool. No, but I'm good, man. Like, obviously, Arsenal have been topsy turvy. We got back to winning ways. That's why I want to start there, man. What are we saying for the Forest game? What did you feel about it? Let us have everything. Forest game. Um, yeah, I I, th I think I felt quite. Um... I don't know, maybe, maybe the wrong word, vindicated, but I think I felt quite like, um, ha yeah, quite secure with that game. Because I thought, of, I sort of felt it was coming for a long time. And the thing is, is, you know, as, I don't know, I guess it's quite a naturally positive fan. You kind of, you kind of get, a, I, don't, I was getting a little bit doubtful over the international break and going like, are we a good team? There was like a couple of moments where you're like, maybe I've just overrated us and we actually are this terrible team. But then, of course, you remind, you go you go back and see that performance. Every sort of thought goes through your head. Yeah, of course. It, you, and naturally, you doubt yourself. But, you know, that's kind of the fan's job, right? You, you just you just sort of, sort of have those periods of doubt. But, like, yeah, I think it was a really nice vindication of, like, no, 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 this is a good team. We are still good. Our players are still good. We still have good ideas. We still know what we're doing. It's just a case of of being patient. And I think that result had been coming for a while and that performance had been coming for a while. I really felt that was... And, you know, yeah, okay, people can say it's only Nottingham Forest. Fine. But we performed brilliantly against Inter. Didn't get the result. I felt on balance we should have got the result against Chelsea. I felt on balance we should have got the re result against City. So I felt like finally the results caught up with the performances. And I felt, yeah, technically, tactically, physically, we, we looked back where we know we can be. So I was really pleased overall, 100%. I think you're bang on the money. Let's kind of break down that performance. The first person I want to ask you about, Mikel Moreno, because for me, it seems like there's a lot of extreme opinions since this guy has signed for our club. And some fans were saying he played bad. I don't agree with that. I think he actually had a decent game. I actually think he's been decent for us. What did you make of his performance against Forrest? I, I really like Moreno. I understand yeah. why fa there, there's certain fans who... Um, maybe struggle with him a little bit more. What I would say is I think he, I think my phrase is he's, he's a rewatch player where I think you kind of don't uh, like, be, let's, let's be real. I don't think about him during the game. I'm thinking about Erdogan and think about Saka and think about Salib, whatever. And I'm thinking about their performances and I'm noting them. Marino, I don't think about during the game and I don't want he's to. Doing his in, job. The same way, in the same way, but like David Raya, you don't want to think about goalkeeper. And I think in that position, it is sort of similar to the kind of the, the Xhaka role. I don't think we want to be thinking about him, but I think if you watch him back, I had this way of phrasing it yesterday, which is probably best to, best to put it, um, which is essentially, I think if Arsenal win a turnover, he is involved. Nine times out of ten. Nine times out of ten. Either in the first action where he wins the ball, the second action where it's the second ball, so someone else has won the ball and he, he hoovers it up, or that he's the third action where the ball goes out to him once we've regained the ball. To have that player who is that reliable in the duel, to have that player who is so reliable at winning the ball back, it, it, it underpins our entire game. The ability, the, the reason you you see a Martin Odegaard comp, or you see a Bakaya Saka comp, they look brilliant on the ball, is because we've got the ball. <laughs> so he's one of the guys. Is <laughs> one of the guys who can get it back. It's it's that basic. And also, I think another thing that I was struggling with for his last couple of weeks was our kind of technical execution. I think something that kind of gets missed out a little bit in kind of an online fan debate, you kind of have the the tactical guys, the guys who kind of, you know, make every game about the tactics. Then you have the guys who are, let's call it, you know, the reactionary guys or whatever you want to call it. You sort of have these camps or whatever. I don't know where the technical guys are. I don't know where the guys are who are every game saying we didn't execute today or we did execute today. It's so important. And you forget that 
these players, you know, that they're given a plan, they're given a, 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 a way of thinking. Uh, okay, when he stands there, you do this. They work on something all week and then have to replicate on a match team, and, and they have to actually do it. And <laughs> we it feels like exactly. we never talk about execution and just things like touch and like you know whether Raya's throws were accurate and those things. Those things, along with someone like a Marino just constantly hoovering up, underpin the performance. And then the tactics are allowed to thrive. Then the players are allowed to thrive. But without the execution, without the technical security, you don't have that. And I think Marino is one of those players who just keeps it so simple. Wins the ball back, plays it off. Doesn't miscontrol things. Doesn't, you know, whatever. Look, has he got a way to go? Of course he has. You know, I think there's some there's some concerns I have when, especially when we're further up the pitch in terms of where he stands. I think I don't think he's quite got that rice thing where he knows he's got a sort of got the dual responsibility and he jumps between the two. I think he could probably get more involved. I think there's more goals to come from him, etc. But he's been here what a couple of months and he's been injured most of the time. So I think I'm 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 really pleased with him personally. You mentioned it there, you know, that I agree with generally what you said about Sometimes, with the exception of probably Bournemouth and Newcastle, the performances at times haven't been amazing, but they haven't been bad, and we haven't correlated that to a result. Against Nottingham Forest, going into the game, let's be honest, it's a game we're expected to win, but considering the context is, I'd still say we were the favourites, but it was a lot more rosier where Nottingham Forest are concerned than us. Why do you think there was, simply put the handbrake off, because there was a lot of changes, like we actually played very entertaining football, I mean, we scored three goals. Why do you think that was there? Um, well, I th I, look, some of this is going to be luck. Some of this is going to be, um, you yeah, know, like captain back. Yeah. Having the captain back, you know, basic stuff, you know, just having a break, things like, you know, Erdogan and Saka not going away on internationals and those things. Right. I think another part of the picture is I think the, the mix between physical power and technical power was, was right. I think in that team for that for that day, and sometimes you, you're going to get it wrong, sometimes you're going to get it right. I think it was right. What I mean by that is sometimes we have, you know, a, I think at away at was it where Bournemouth you had a Rice Parte, um, Marino midfield. Marino. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. Which Horrible. is for me, balance wise, it is is not right. You can't access the middle. Um, and then also sort of further forward, if I look at that front line, Saka, Trossard, and Jesus is probably a little bit over towards the technical side of things but as a as a as a sort of a reference trossard out wide could just hold on to the ball trossard has issues he can't create separation on the left and i yeah i don't love a lot of a lot of his actions but what he can do is when you give the ball in the same way that saka does if you look on fbrf i think it's like passes received per like or uh passes received or some some kind of data trossard's right up there in terms of ability to hold on to the ball get out of tight spaces and recycle it. And that ability, if you can go left as a reference and push up as a team, know you'll get that ball back. It's really useful. I think Martinelli is someone who, who you know, he's a different player. He does use the, he does lose the ball a little bit more and he's probably better in open spaces. I just felt we got that balance right. I think Hab uh, Jesus for, for, for Havertz was another one of those decisions, even though his touch, I don't think, was particularly good on the day. I think he was someone who was a different reference than, than Havertz uh, in that space. Instead of a, a runner or a kind of um, someone you can go long to, he's someone you can go ball to feet to. So I just think the balance was 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 better. And finally, I'll come to Jorginho. I thought Jorginho had a, firstly had a brilliant game, and secondly, is someone who <laughs> I said this. For, you'll hate this. I said this phrase on the Canna podcast um, about a pass palette. That's possibly the worst oh, thing I've ever said. Where do you get him, man? Where I'm, do you I'm make so these sorry. things up? I'm so know? sorry. But listen, the, the people loved it. His pass palette, and you can kill You me. know what? I must admit, that ain't the worst one. That's actually one of your better ones. I must admit. <laughs> I can fuck with that one. <laughs> there's, been, there's been worse ones. His 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 pass selection, his his kind of his his taste for passing, I think is the most mature in the squad. In terms of if you look at Rice and and, and Parte. I think Partey is extreme. They're probably two ends of a spectrum. Partey is extremely progressive. Rice is a little bit more conservative, not as much Facts. as people say, but but a little bit more conservative. I think Jorginho no feels like he just has a sense. He's got the blend of go it. forward, when to recycle, when the game needs a little bit of punch through the lines, and when the game just needs. Okay, I'm just gonna knock the ball back here. We don't need anything. And I'm sort of from a pro an approach perspective. Just just finally, I was really pleased with that approach in terms of. Because sometimes in these sorts of games, especially when you've been on a bad run, you can throw everything. You go, okay, well, let's let's just you oh, know, let's put all, and then all our runners on the pitch. Transitions. Erdegaard, one area, and you know, 
Marino midfield, whatever it might be. Mm. And you just go, okay, just just chill and allow someone like a Georgina to come in. I think that balance for me was was better. You mentioned it there, yeah. Would you make it Ethan? Because I actually feel I know there's a rush to want to play him by some fans, and I understand it. I wanted him to get more football purely because of Odegaard being out and what we had available. But I think isolated to Ethan, I think Mikel Arteta is bang on the money with what he's doing with his development, right? But I, I want to ask you about Ethan, big him up for the goal. Raheem Sterling, like, do you think he deserves more of a chance? <laughs> Sometimes faces can say, say, can say everything <laughs> right. I don't know. How do you feel about Sterling? Because you, I, I think I remember in the summer you were you you're a Sterling fan, and this isn't me going. Oh, you, yeah. I, I'm 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 also I I don't see the Sterling that I know. You know what I mean? Yeah, bang on the money, Alex. Like clearly we don't like. Obviously, the Raheem Sterling signing was done on deadline day. It wasn't planned. There was a relationship of convenience. You know, we we did hide behind the whole Mikel Arteta knows him and whatnot. I think he's down on I think he's down on his luck, but at the same time, I don't think he'll change our fortunes, but mainly because of Trossard and the injuries and just the climate we're in. I honestly feel as much as I don't, I'm not necessarily pushing for him to start. It's like if you don't give him a chance, how do we know? I'm not a fan of him on the right wing. I know he set up Ethan. I really just want to see him on the left. But yeah, like I just I can't see light at the end of the tunnel with Sterling, if I'm honest with you. And it's I, a shame because I like the guy. I agree on wanting him on the left. I really do. Just trying to look up numbers, partly because and I think I might have said this actually last time we were on. I think it might have been like post Preston. I can't remember. Anyway, when he receives on the right, Saka's ability to hold width. So, like, say the the the, the touchlines there. Saka is mm. often receiving it about here, and Sterling yeah. always receives In just, in, just inside. And so he doesn't give himself the space to face his man up. And he's often either forced out wide or has to recycle. Because Saka receives it, he's got a little bit of space to go, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna face you up, I'm gonna do that stutter stuff and then beat you and then come inside wherever it might be. He doesn't doesn't have that. He's also obviously the the wrong foot for our system on that side. How many minutes has he got this year? Let me just look that up. He's got two, two Champions League appearances. He's got five Premier League appearances, 130 minutes. 39 minutes in the Champions League, 171 in, in the EFL Cup. Okay, so three, 340 minutes. That's not that's not nothing. It isn't, but at the same time, like, what can I expect? I mean, the only way you're going to get more first-team football is if you kind of do what we used to see Trossard do, whether you're playing 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 5 minutes, impacting the game. But as we both know, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying he needs to start, if you haven't been given a run of games, bearing in mind, technically, you started on the back foot because you was kind of alienated as the season started. It's like, what can I really expect from you? I just think Arteta looks at it as, as I trust him. I know him. He's a squad player. That's it, really and truly. Yeah. And when we go and beat Nottingham Forest 3-0, no, I can't really complain, like, if I'm honest. But yeah, you, I you think, get I the results. Think deserve and... a chance. All right, can I share my screen? Go on. How do you, how do you rock that? Uh, I think I can. Can you see that? There we go. So Brilliant. my my issue with Sterling, so yeah, the whole thing about him receiving on the right, it, he's kind of receiving in these pockets and Saka receives out here. Exactly. He and Saka's left foot so that touch is taking you inside. Exactly. He's coming inside. Exactly. So he's receiving it here and then he either, because he's right foot, as you say, he's either forced back or he can't quite create the separation to beat his man there. If he received it f further out wide, and by the way, this side, and which this is what we're saying. Saka thing, he'd have the space. But actually, I think Modern football, everyone's so good that I think it becomes even more important to put people in positions where they can do the thing that no one else can. And Sterling in this zone here, around here, in terms of carries, you that just want carries where... neat little one twos and get in the final actions, bro. That is where he cooks, and he is not enough in those positions. And me and me and George on the Canada podcast go back and forth about Martinelli and constantly talking about, you know, is he being platformed? Is he being platformed? Or is Sterling being platformed? Is Sterling being given these zones? Because once he gets through here, I mean, his decision making once he passes about this zone is horrific. But if he, to get the ball up here, he's one of the best. Facts. Right, facts. What else have we got to speak about? Uh, what else did I want to ask you about? How big a blow is it to lose Benjamin White? And a bit of a double fold question. How big of a blow is it to lose Ben White for the rest of the year? Where are you at with Tommy Asu, man? You know I love him. But it's it, the form and the, what you can do on a pitch is becoming irrelevant, Tommy. 
Yeah, there, there needs there there needs to be a line at some point. I, d- I don't know if we've crossed it because it's the the problem with injuries is and similar with Ben White. And I get it. The club kind of can't give us too much information, but you're working off very little information. So, for example, with, with Ben White, if that was an injury that he knew about in the summer and sort of expected at some point he needed to get surgery on, I'm furious because I'm like, you didn't go to the Euros. Just get get that done then. But I don't know that. I'm, so I'm angry at the clouds. I'm angry at the clouds. But if it's something he... They, he, well, not he, that's not fair. He, the club, the management, his team, whatever. If everyone knew about that, but was like, we think we can manage it, and then you get to sort of this around this time, he just says, no, I can't manage it, then it's just unfortunate. And he's got through, you know, both, bro. On a, possibly, possibly. So with Tommy Asso, I think he's been sent away now, a different environment. I also, admit, I'm also really cautious around these things because, especially with a long term injury like, like Tommy there might be other stuff going on. And I don't know. And that's not an excuse for Tommy Asu. And at some point, and there's a different conversation around what the club needs to do with him. And, and ultimately, if you can't rely on that player, you just have to move on. And and probably this is, for me, his last chance saloon. And by the way, if we do find someone in January who we think can do the same squad role and be more available and give us the same level of output for less wages, I'd do it 100%. Of course I would. But for me, probably the summer is, is the point where you you change. But we don't know, that, and this is the thing with injuries and and, and always with fitness and, and stuff, is and it's not that's not me absolving the club of any responsibility, but the amount of data they have on these guys. I look at someone like a Malassia, clearly something's gone on there. I, I don't know what's happened, but we all have difficulties in our lives. We all have periods of our lives that, that stuff's happened. Legal trouble of things that we don't know about, and I'm not referring to what you think I'm referring to. You know, other <laughs> other other things that, that that's going Where? on, other things that's going on off off the pitch. And, you know, with relationships, whatever it might be. I don't know. Would I be surprised if that's what's happening with Tommy? To be clear, I don't know anything. Would I be surprised if that's what's going on with Tommy Asu? Honestly, no. And we obviously um, hope that that's not the case. It's just yeah, purely and football and injuries. I really hope it's just football. And if it is, then. Yeah, that's a concern. But at some point, I have to start using my brain and going, hmm. And also, I don't know if you saw, um, Zinchenko said something on like this like, pro-direct soccer thing. He was like, basically asked about his teammates. And he was like, who's Zinchenko the... never shuts up, does he? <laughs> he loves talking. He really doesn't. He loves talking for no yeah, reason. <laughs> I would I would love so, man, but I don't think I'd ever be happy. But yeah, go on, man. <laughs> He'd incriminate himself. He'd do a Ramsdale. Literally. Um, <laughs> But yeah, he said you. something like, in three years, he's never heard Tommy Asu open his mouth. And I'm like, okay. No. And I, I know you shouldn't read too much into that, but like, just the fact he's a very quiet guy, very shy, you know, there's a reason for those things. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not wishing... You to get that vibe with Tommy, like he's almost too humble. And I'll take a kind of echoes that in press conferences, like he keeps saying like, you're so good with both feet, you need to believe in yourself a bit more. It's like, I do think it's... One, that's one thing I like about kind of the Asian region countries and Japanese and stuff. They're very humble. There's a lot of humility and you get that from Tommy Asu. But the flip side is, I don't think he knows how good he is. And that's why I'm kind of angry about the injuries because you look at Man City away, you look at Chelsea, you look at what we said with Benjamin White. Tommy Asu is the perfect player to have in the squad, whether you've got tough games, whether you need to manage games. Yeah. And I'm a bit like you that I have to give him the luxury of, I don't know what's going on, whether it's injuries or personal issues or setbacks, et cetera. But in the summer, there might have to be uncomfortable conversations. Me and you have spoken about it before to the point where when he signed his new deal, we both said on, on this platform, like, had he not had these injuries, he probably gets a longer deal. Oh, so it's, a, it's a weird one. And I, I was here a year ago. I don't know if you remember, to, like Tommy Asu was in the team. He was our left. He was basically our left back. We, and we, he was we in had a those sweet issues spot of form in the a final period, third for a draw. period, hundred percent. But for a period, do you remember the severe game away last year? I remember Tommy Asu was left back. He was unbelievable. He was this attacking the thing. last line. He was in. He was. He was great. He was really, really brilliant. And you know, so he, you know, he he could have. Ne- we had those issues with the left back slot, and everyone was saying, "Oh, Arsenal's left back." That could have been Tommy Asu. So I, I don't want to just throw that away, and it, it's a shame. It really is a shame. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm not trying to speculate. I don't know. But I'm, but that is my point. I don't know, so I don't want to spend too much time saying he, he he's too injured all the time. It could be something else. I don't know. Does does it concern you, or maybe concern is not the right word? But does it make you a bit cautious? Because obviously we're now in that period where the games are coming thick and fast. What we've got sport in West Ham, the Man United. Obviously, 
Timber and Calafiori have had their own injury knocks and we kind of have to manage them. There's no Benjamin White. There's no Tommy. You're probably looking at Partey having to put a shift in, in at right back. Yeah. How does that make you feel going into this kind of condensed calendar list? I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, someone like a Tommy Asu would be perfect in this, yeah, exactly. in this role. I think we're okay. I do Obviously, think we're okay. Obviously, we're in Zinni as well, to be fair. Yeah. I think, like, there's enough combinations with, if I think about the right-back slot, Timber, Partey. I mean, so, you know, realistically, I think they're 31 games before the next international break. Tommy might be back for, let's say, 10 of them. So, who knows? Um, so, there's that. Uh, I think... Saliba can play out there. I don't want it. I'm not saying he's going to play out there, but Saliba can play out there. Calafiori can play out there. Declan Rice can obviously shift back and move things around. Uh, we've got loads of centre back options. I, I think we're okay. I think my. Obviously, you've got Lewis got, Skelly as well. Lewis Skelly as well. Josh Nichols as well. Yeah. So I, yeah, I just, I think we'll be okay. It's just, it's obviously not ideal. And, you know, knowing us, it's going to be the one position that hurts us because someone's going to get injured and whatever. It's just be absolute classic. But I think, like, if if the decision was Ben Ben White play on risk injuring himself long, long, long term, or just get through this period, I think we have enough. We should have enough. But equally, you know, there's a month until the market opens, and and if we if we're interested in something, I I, I and and you know we've had more injuries or it doesn't feel like someone's up to up to the job, then then why not? You know, I I, I I'm. I I, I I I sometimes think, and this could be a conversation maybe around. I do. I don't know. I sometimes think we're so project focused and so like, it, are, is that a good contract for Arsenal? Is that, but sometimes we never do, well, no, we never do those very short term, like, you know, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't, but you know, the, the Jesse Lingard's West Ham at the end of the season type deals. <laughs> it's just like, and that obviously that works out unbelievably, but no, I hear where you're coming from. those types of deals where it's like, we just have a position we need to fill we're just going to get that guy and, and that's it. We don't need... I think we did that with Sterling. Different contexts, but I'd say that's the closest yeah. I've got to what you're saying. It's the closest we've got. And, and that feels like a, you know, kind of a, um, a plaster. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, we've only... Basically, we've got a month to get through. And then I think we... I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if we at least looked, depending on how... But then also Ben White might be back by the end of January. So, who knows? It's a, it's a, it's a weird one because I feel... I might be a conspiracy theorist, but... I reckon Tommy Asu's had a setback. They knew Calafuri'd be back. They wanted to kind of, they've kind of known about this Ben White thing. They've kind of wanted to tick over and they said, you know what, you lot are coming back. Let's just bite the bullet now with Benjamin White and then let's just see where it's going. And I think where I'm looking at it on a weird one is in a good, and this, when I speak about Ben White, he's the perfect example of when people say footballers don't care. He's known to, I don't want to say lie about injuries, but lie about being injured just so he can play. And obviously that could be at his detriment. So I do think Ben White's one of them. He will be pushing and quite frankly, annoying the team doctors to be back. But yeah. I think we, I think it's been coming, man. You know, for the last few years, we've kind of played him into the ground. I remember Rob Holden did an interview and spoke about, man, do you remember when we missed out to top four against Newcastle and Spurs? Yeah. How he oh, was playing with, <laughs> yeah, like he was playing with a madness. Like, Ben White, I've got a lot of time for you. And it's a shame. Well, to be fair, against Man United and Rashford, that's the only time I'm scared when you play. But yeah, I'm going to miss him. Do you think we need to act in the January market? Um... <sighs> Okay, so yeah, the right right back thing potentially. I think for me, next summer, there's. I, I don't think we have. So I had a discussion about this with um, with George on on the cannon, and George was sort of making the point that we have loads to do, and I was sort of saying, I actually don't think we do. But you can always give yourself a list. You can always say, well, we we need to get rid of that. Then. You, well, you can you can go. We need to find a Jorginho and Partey replacements, and we need a striker, and we need a new winger, and you could do all of that. We need a couple of goalies. We need a couple of goalies. You could say we need a laundry list of players, or you can say we only need maybe a backup goalkeeper and a striker. You could you could you could make that argument. Keep Jorginho That's what I said. I agree yeah, it's 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 it it depends what you think you need to do. The the one thing I would say is in January. There are a couple of kind of release clauses sniffing around in terms of, uh, I think uh, sheshko has got one. I think Jokerez has one. Jokerez, Sesko, technically. I, saw, I don't know if you watch. Oh, this as well, allegedly. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Apparently they've all got release clauses. Yeah. Oh, so, they? and I, I don't know if you saw Mikel's, um, did you say apart from you? What? 
Did you say apart from me? No, 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 no. Oh, I can't remember. I said, I didn't say that. All got release clauses apart from me. <laughs> no, 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 right. no, no, no. <laughs> um, I'm a free yeah, agent, man. I play fullback for the club, mate. <laughs> Oh, um, man. But Mikel was in a press conference yesterday. And he, he talks about well, he was asked about Jokeres, and he was. I mean, normally he's just like, yeah, they're a good player, but he just refused to answer it. I found it really, that really interesting. I'm not saying that's Jokeres, but I think he's aware. I, I get the sense he's aware. There's a lot of conversation, and he, you know, he's always being asked about it. So, are I if we were going to go and do something in the summer that we feel it lifts the team. I would I wouldn't be against doing it in January. Again, coming back to this point of like we have this thing of like yeah, but you know the market's better in the summer and you knew. But okay, we turn into diplomats, man. Let's be honest, Arsenal fans. We not... become accountants and diplomats yeah. and transfer experts and all the rest of it. Absolutely, and if it, can, it, if it can give us a, a a boost in in the middle of the season, I'm not against it. But also, you might just need on balance just say actually it's, it's just not the right time. I don't think there's any glaring squad holes. I think there's always work to do. Always, you know, you can you can look ahead and go, literally every position and say, do we need this? Do we need that? Whatever. I think the basics and the fundamentals of the, of the squad are there. But if we can do something in January to 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 push that, especially especially in the forward areas, further forward, I, yeah, I'd be quite open to that. More open than I have been before. I think. I think you're bang on the money. And you said something interesting about release clauses because, again, I've never seen these players' contracts. Is, but you hear that about Jokeres, you hear that about Sesco, you hear that about Zubamendi, you hear that about Kudas. There's a bunch of those players. Whether we activate them is another thing. And I'm with you in that. I wouldn't say I'd force it, but if there is a deal to be done, mm -hmm. I would. And it's a bit of a weird one in that typically you think January is difficult to do business and we've not done anything really significant, but where you look at where we tried to get Kai Seder, where we tried to get Mudrik, I don't know how far we went, but we tried to get Blahovic. Now, obviously these things didn't work out, but it shows you that if a player makes sense, they will kind of force the boat out. So I do hope that's the case. What position if you could only get one? Cause just, I mean, if we could get Isaac in January, it'd be amazing, but I'm dreaming. I, I would probably say a winger, you know, a versatile winger or the Tommy Asu type. Yeah, I don't know. I ju I I think yeah, maybe a wide a wide forward. But do we, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's really hard to say. I think you you can make an argument that our squad is full, as I say. So really, then, I mean, it's a, yeah. You, I think you can. I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying I believe that. But you can. Let's make hear this argument. argument. Okay. Let's give the people the content. <laughs> you, uh, as in for this season. On the left, you have Martinelli, Sterling, Jesus. Uh, you can you seen Sterling there. on the left? Tross Trossard. Well, no, but as in, as in, you can make. My point is, you, no, my point is not that I believe this. My point is, you can make that argument. <laughs> now I'm playing on the right. Man. On the right, you can play Saka. You can play Trossard there. We have played Trossard there. You can play Jesus there. Um, I think even Ethan could play on the right. And Ethan I, could play on the that's right. That's another thing. You can go through. The, my point is, you can go through the squad and you can say we've got three, four, five options in it, basically every position. I then think you say, okay, then what are we missing? And that becomes a little bit harder to answer. And I think you, for me, I still feel we lack real explosive pace in the front line. I still think we lack transitional threat, which doesn't necessarily mean an attacker, by the way. I still think we lack a little bit of overlap quality on both sides in terms of a right and left back. Um and yeah, I, I don't know. But then that doesn't, for example, the transitional quality, that doesn't have to mean a striker. That could be a midfielder who is devastating on the transition of, you know, a, a De Bruyne type in terms of in that way. You know what I mean? Um, so I really don't know. I don't have a particularly clear clear picture. I have skills that I think are missing from the team in terms of that transitional quality, in terms of that, say, Rafa Leal burst over five yards out wide. I don't think we have that. Um, I still think we lack a little bit of something in terms of killers in the final third. But again, is that a forward or is that a out wide? I don't know. We can do I it both ways, have... ideally. Well, but that's a, that's a dangerous one. I mean, not a dangerous one, but that's a that's where I'm with you. That if you could do it in January, great. But I think that's kind of a summer thing, or maybe something we should have done in the summer. But I'd love a central can... midfielder. I can't see it happening though. Yeah, I don't think it'll happen. Yes, yeah, someone a little bit more. Kind of someone that's different, like a younger kind of someone that's more closely aligned to how Jorginho's on on the ball than a Declan Rice and Mikel Moreno. Uh, I'm forgetting somebody, Thomas Partey. How can I forget him? He's been quite good this season. But then we got a lot of the base in the midfield, and you know you could even argue that 
if you only have one pivot player and, and the fullback's coming in, like that's, is that, that's you know, a couple so, need to leave before you do that, in my opinion. Yeah. So it's hard to say. And, and also if I'm looking at like a different type of midfielder, I then look at like Miles and Ethan and I'm like, am I am I kind of pulling you back a little bit? Because I, I genuinely think Ethan is like could be in the first team within about six months. So like I I I like it's it's possible. So someone who can receive in the block, someone who can turn Such a player, man. The goal, someone who in that sort of pocket on the right hand side is just He's got that nonchalant gimmick as they say on social yeah, media yeah, as well. Yeah. I, I got a lot of time for Ethan and Lewis Skelly. So, good. so yeah, I, I you know, I'll, I'll repeat myself. I don't know. I think it's going to come back to the talent. It's going to come back to is there a talent that we that we fall in love with that that kind of fills the gap? Wenger used to say a super player. Whether we're able to yeah. do that's another thing. And again, I don't know how we look at it because obviously Edu's left in it. Like to a degree, I don't feel that should derail what the club's doing. It's like a thing where, of course, another sporting director might come in and Edu was going to sign X player. He thinks that he's not good enough, but I'd imagine he just picks up the slack. But then I look at it and say with that kind of transitional period, is it the right time to make a signing? Which goes back to what you're saying. If there's kind of a deal to be done, a skills gap, kind of something, you know, the, the kind of way we kind of sign Trossarts, the Kivios and them kind of players, I think we will do it. If not, I just think we'll get on with it. What do you make of Partey this year? Do you think he deserves a new deal? It's that typical case of a player playing out of their skin, really, in the last year of their deal. He's fit as well. Injury crisis, he's been fit. He is fit. Partey's been brilliant. You can make an argument he's been our best midfielder. Um, I would argue because Rice has been in the wrong position. Erdegaard's been out and Mourinho's been out. Are people doing he, too much with Declan Rice, man? But that's for another stream. Like, doing yeah. what he did, it, it pisses me off. Like, Of course, do I like Rice in the eight? No. Uh, for, for the traditional eight stuff in midfield, I don't like it. From what Arteta demands of the press and all of that crap, 100%, you know, I like that. The man's a six. Like, the man's a six. You know, you saw yeah, it against yeah. Liverpool. The man's a six. I don't feel it's we've sick. helped him since he's played for this club. He's had many different partners. I understand them lazy fans who go, oh, he's 100 million. He's got to do this. He's got to do that. He's got to save world hunger. He's got to do everything. But we've got a lot of issues than Declan Rice, bro. And I'm not being funny. I know the price tag and all of these things. But he's in his mid-20s. He's won a trophy with West Ham. He's been capped X amount of times for England, played X amount of times in the Premier League. While I like the fact that Mikel Arteta is teaching him new things, this is how this is what he's been. I'm not even taking a piss out of Declan Rice, but you're a water carrier in a good way in midfield. Your job is to be a box-to-box -box man, win the ball back, give it to the more creative players. Anything you do is about beyond that is a bonus, like you're seeing with the set pieces. I, it pees me off. It genuinely pees me off with the Declan Rice stuff. And the man's clearly been playing with knocks, like... We've got bigger problems than Declan Rice, but I'm biased because he can do no wrong for me. I can't lie to you. But yeah. a bit what you said, no, he's I, in the wrong position. I broadly agree. I think he's in the wrong position. And I think I, I understand why he's been played there, but I like yeah. I just can't I can't when he gets a run with as behind behind Marino and Erdegaard, I think we'll see something. But I, I don't yeah, it's but it, it's but he had that option on Saturday to do it. So yeah, I don't know. But um yeah, we we parte. I, I yeah, I think he's. I think he's had a great season. He's been brilliant. I still think he's not suitable for all game states, but he's a brilliant player. I would probably give him like a plus one. Yeah, maybe plus fair. two. Fair. He's fair. thirty, nearly thirty-two. Fair, thirty-one, turning thirty-two. So yeah, I'll probably give him a plus one or plus two. Um, look, you know, the conversation is there, isn't it? But I, I, I just speaking on pure football. Um, I think he's. I think if I was just thinking it through that lens, I'd probably give him a plus. Yeah, plus one or two. Maybe, maybe, op, maybe one plus club option. If that makes sense. Um, I think. You're I, right. I, because I think Jorginho probably will go. I think his contract ends next summer. I'm pretty sure. Same time. Same time as Partey. And that's why I asked you because obviously Partey's form has made me change my mind and ask you that question. But when I looked at both of them, I probably would have leaned towards Thomas Partey because he plays a lot more than Jorginho. But at the same time, if I factor in things that really and truly I'm not seeing, like it seems like Jorginho's a big character. He's got coaching ambitions. You know, he's he's, he's an extension like Odegaard on the, coaching, on the coaching front on a match day. I thought Jorginho might stay because of that. But now I think he will leave. There's a reality where... Both could stay, both could leave, one could stay. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's a lot of planning to be done. It's like what you said in that, what you, what you said earlier about you don't always have a lot to do, but you can make a list. And well, I hope we've got a list, really. I think you're yeah, I mean, that. I mean, if if Arsenal, one of the most stable squads in the world, has loads to do, then then I think I think we've got an issue. I think it's it's more about what you want to do. Um, and you can kind of create needs in your mind. Yeah, you could go for another season with with a Jorginho party. It just depends how good you think they are. 
I think I think Jorginho will go. I think Partey will stay, and I think we'll sign probably a bit of a sort of a prospect and someone who is a bit more of a sort of metronomic. I don't know if you've ever seen that Redondo. There he goes with his words again. (laughs) (laughs) I don't get where he's going. That wasn't my... I didn't make that one up, though. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, there's this Redondo guy I think I've seen before who looks pretty good. You know, like the the sort of the player who is very... You see those comps and they're stood in the same position doing all the Busquets stuff. I think think that sort of player. Um, Yeah, but I don't know. I I I think just speaking football, I think Partey will stay, to be honest. How do you feel about the title race? I saw your tweet about... I don't want to take your words out of context, but not being convinced about Liverpool. Let us know. Well, the Liverpool fans got very touchy about that, didn't they? You should know better. Um, you know that's going to happen. No, it's fine. It's, 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 it's a game. It doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah. I, f- yeah, I, I'm just not convinced by them. And it's, right. I found it really interesting that they, that, uh, again, it's a, it's a small section of Liverpool fans, but there was a lot of them, a lot of online Liverpool fans and the sort of the big accounts that I'm aware of are Liverpool fans who went on it. And I just sort of think if you're... Condi- if, I, if I think back to like our run in 23-24, the end of the season, or our run at the beginning of 22-23, when I'm on that sort of run. I don't... Uh, personally, I don't care if someone's like, oh, I don't think I'm very good. Okay, cool. All right, I know what we're going to do. Back. I, don't, I don't need to like prove it you don't need validation from external sources really 100 percent. they know they're they've had an easy run of fixtures they know that they know they're about to go into a difficult period they know they have a 32 year old mohammed salah who's giving his third interview in seven years in the mix zone talking about how he wants to potentially leave the club he's had not had an offer playing the, the the game of chicken where if liverpool offer him a contract He's going to turn it down because it's not four hundred fifty thousand pounds a week. <clears throat> and by the way, they shouldn't give him four hundred fifty thousand pounds a week. So they're in a bit of a. Ultimately, he's getting his last contract. He's not going to do that at Liverpool. I'm sorry, he's not. He's not signing another contract at Liverpool because the num the numbers he wants, he's only getting at Saudi, a smart club like Liverpool, and they are smart. Are not going to give him the the numbers he wants. But it's not happening. He's also in the last four. And I didn't tweet this out because I thought I might send a couple of people over the edge. The last four years, there's always been about a 10, 15 game sample where Salah goes quiet. He has this every single season. When, when is that? Because I can take him out of my FPL. I'm actually top of my league. So at the end of the season, know when that period is. Go, go and look at Salah's numbers. Do you want me to show you? Yeah, man, go on. You look at Salah's numbers at the end of every season, team, he dips. And my point is not that Salah, Salah isn't, okay, actually, Salah is an all timer. Salah is an all-time. Yeah, he's one of the best ever to have played in the Prem. But this idea that you can play the way they're playing, which, by the way, is not good. They did not break Southampton's press once. The The goals they scored all came from Southampton mistakes. Southampton were playing through them. Southampton were creating... But that first goal was horrible, man. <laughs> Big up Liverpool, but that first goal was horrible. How are you a worse keeper than Ramsdale? <laughs> no, I don't have to pretend anymore. If you, if you think he can keep this up, then fair enough. Then, then this is why I'm not convinced. If you think he can at 32 years of age with no contract, then fair enough. Absolutely fine. But I'm telling you, I'm looking through the last few seasons and I'm going to 23, 24. And I'm seeing a 32 year old who has an unbelievable bit at the start of the season. And then basically nothing towards the end. Damn. And that's the important running as well. That's the running, right? And then I'm going back to 20, I think it's maybe this season. Where again he has a brilliant start to the campaign. So he had this brilliant start to the campaign here, loads of goals and assists, ends Same. the campaign, tails off. He does this basically every year. I think there's one season maybe, and you can go further back if you want, but I won't bore you with it. But he so this is this is the I think he had a bit of a bad season anyway. He never kind of really got going. You, this could, one. you could argue, yeah, the end of the season, but he never he never does what he does for the whole season. By the way, because he can't, because yeah, it's he's difficult. It's really bloody difficult, right? Definitely. So this idea, and, and and this is why I think they're, they're, they are the way they are, because they know they rely on transition. They know they rely on their individuals. They know in the Nunes, Gakpo, whatever, they have a lot of runners, a lot of diversity in their attack, but they don't have, I would say, a settled way of doing things. I think McAllister's a, a weakness. I think uh, Damn, Martin, he's not been in great form, to be fair, McAllister. I think Canate and Van Dijk are lazy defenders, to be honest, and they rely on their oh. men natural ability no no I'm, I'm i'm being serious in terms of pushing up in terms of defending channels i think robertson's a weakness bro uh, and they haven't had any injuries i haven't had, a, had any serious fixtures i'm this confident about liverpool look if at the end of the season 
they go through the whole season and they've done they've done what they need to do and they win the title, they will deserve it and I will be wrong. Liverpool fans, I will be wrong. I'll eat humble pie. But I'm saying right now, I haven't been convinced. I'm more convinced by City because all the fundamentals, I don't look at their game model and go, I see a lot of weaknesses. I look at Liverpool and say, you're reliant on transition. You're reliant on a 32-year-old. I see how teams break through you easily through your press. I see how you can't break teams down consistently. I see how you're relying on defenders who don't push up. I see how Robertson's fading. I see how Trent doesn't want to be there. I, like, I'm going through and I'm going, okay, okay, okay. I hope I'm you're right, man. I'm just not convinced. And then if, if they do it, then fair enough. But I'm not convinced. And the so fact where you that at with City, so many people is, so, is interesting. So where are you at with City? Because you kind of said like you're more convinced with City. Like I, That's a bit unfair, surely. Like, like I hear you and I think you've articulated. And for what it's worth, I think... You could have you could add a caveat of Liverpool could obviously get better. I think they're good. I just think 11, 12 games in, too many conclusions are being drawn. They obviously have weaknesses like everyone. Obviously, they're in the driving seat. And as you said, if they go and win it, great. The one thing they have that we don't generally have is the vast majority of their players, whether they're past it or not, they've been there. I do think even if Liverpool win the league this year, next year in the summer, they really have to back on slot because they bought him a half hit Chiesa. But then where are you at with City? City got smoked by them lot down the lane. What's that? Four or five defeats in a row. Pep's new deal didn't do anything. So, like, yeah, where are you at with City then? And then obviously, piggy banking off that question, where are you at with, you said where are you at with Liverpool? Where are you at with City? And what does that mean for Arsenal's title hopes to wrap this stream up? Um, I think, uh, look, City will always find a way back. They will always, they're, they're, like, we're, we're in the middle of... I'm starting not to believe it now, but you're right. You're right. Well... But they, they're not they are, yet, but boy. They're city. They really aren't. And you can't count them out. You really can't count them out. Um, uh, look, I, I think City season will be much more defined by the charges and what happens there, to be honest. Um, I think Pep, bro, yeah, bro we've, we've got about a month and a half, I think, until the, the hearing's done. Um, and, and we get our first sort of glimpse of, of what's going to happen. Look, Pep's, Pep was talking about, I'll be here if we get relegated. And before oh, he's not even entertained that. that. No, no, but he, he's he's not even entertained that before. I think he knows if I walk away at this point, I'm forever remembered as the Man City manager who walked away. If I stay and you know Pep can do a rebuild, do you know what I mean? I think he's fine. If I get them back to the top and then win another Prem and then go, which is probably what he thinks he, he I'm the goal even more than than people gave me credit for. I am the goal. Even what you know, I I win those titles. I go away, I come back, I win another title. That then he'll just then he'll walk away happy and go go get the Spain job in 2026. So I think I think that's basically what he wants. I I I think that's way more the look. They're gonna get they're gonna get back to it. it. It's funny because the moment teams start losing, people are looking for fundamental flaws that explains this. I'm seeing like age composition of the squad. Okay, well that wasn't a problem in the summer. You weren't talking about that in the summer. You weren't talking about how you know. Gundawan's passed it and Carl Walker's passed it and Bernardo Silva's passed it and De Bruyne's passed it. No one was saying that in the summer. Maybe there is an aspect of physical decline, but that's not causing him to lose five games in a row. I just wish there'd be dialogue about Phil Foden. I know Saka is held to higher standards, but go on, I'm cutting you off. I just want to respect the no, agenda. No, no, no. No, 100%. 100%. If, if sorry, and yeah, it, 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 it's, I think on Transfer Marked, the... Uh, valuation of Phil Foden is like 10 or 20 million higher than Saka. How? How? Three international tournaments stunk up the place. Never really turns it on when it matters for City. Flat track yeah. bully. Generational talent not being held to generational standards, but that's just me. And he's a great player for what it's worth, but you yeah. got show it. 100%. So if, it, if Phil Foden was was on Saka's level, he would be pulling City out of the dirt this season, but he's not. So, exactly. Um, so yeah, I I I don't worry. I I worry more for City. I don't worry for City at all. But if I was to worry about City, it would be in January and in what happens then. So what does this with what you said about Liverpool and City? What does that mean for Arsenal's title challenge? Like how bullish are you? Well, you said it earlier. You can't call anything at game week thirteen or whatever we're at, and that's why I was saying earlier. Um, but that well, I was saying a couple of weeks ago when when everyone was counting out Arsenal out. You can't conclude anything now. I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying we're going to win. We're not going to win. I'm saying you can't conclude anything, and that that is still the case. It's still November. I'm not going to change it because it's one game week later and we won a game. What I will say 
is I think by New Year's, we'll be surprised by how close we are with Liverpool. I wouldn't be surprised if we're a point off, maybe a point ahead, maybe a point apart. I think we'll be very close. But I, I think we'll pull we'll pull we'll pull ahead. They have a, a tough run of fixtures coming up. They've got to play City. Um Sunday, right? I could be wrong. They're gonna Saturday, be Sunday, one of them. They're gonna be challenged. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're if we're a lot closer to, to Liverpool than we think by New Year's Day, and then it's a race to the end of the season. Do you Honestly. think last question for you then? Like, do you think Arteta has to win a trophy this year? I I have to ask it. I have to. Um I think we spoke about this last time. Look, it's yeah, it's it's all there's the overall um not doing a politician's answer i will answer that um the there is the overall are we improving picture which is always what i judge a manager by but i think we are one of we, in my opinion on our day we are i i would say we're as good as city in certain areas better than certain areas and weaker than them in certain areas i think we're on a level we've we've literally seen it about four times now against city we can match them Certain things they're better than us than us at. Certain things we're better than them at. So I think, based on that, I think we're the two top coach teams and sort of profile teams in the country, in my opinion. And therefore, you should be winning a trophy based off that. Yeah. I mean, there you had it, there, man, Alex. This has been amazing. Let people know they can find you. And obviously, people, before he says that, make sure you're following following him on Twitter and go and check out his piece he did with the Metro, man. But yeah, let's hear it from the horse's mouth, bro. Thanks, bro. Uh, yeah, dude. Check. Uh, I'm on Twitter or X at AM on football. Never called uh, it on that. I'm never called it that. Uh, and uh, YouTube, you can search the different knock and the Canon podcast. There you have it, man. Alex, it's always appreciated, man. You was late, but lateness is greatness. It's almost like a bad man. When your form drops off, there'll be issues. But for now, take care, bro. Hopefully the next time we do this, whether it's on your platform or mine, we're a lot more, well, we are quite positive, but we're a lot more positive. But yeah, people, smash the like button, all that good stuff. We're out. Peace. Appreciate Let's it. Go. Thank you.